Nope, I had a message. You were right. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of get out of being on YouTube. Awesome. And then uh, so you could use. Ah, uh, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I will. I will run around and point and stuff. So I've already kind of given a bit of a, a spiel uh, a little bit earlier over lunch, but uh, this time I actually have slides. So uh, hopefully if I mentioned some things before where you're like, wait, what's going on or what's happening? Maybe this time it will be hopefully a little bit clearer. And so I'm going to be talking today purely about the first part of my title, uh, the neutron star stuff, I think, we simply won't get to if there's any number of questions. So I apologize in advance for the false advertising, um, but I'll be around. So please do come stop by and we can chat about whatever at any point. So what I told you earlier is I said that muons are uh, pretty unique in terms of the plethora of standard model stuff that decays. Um, and the reason is, is essentially this ratio of its mass to its width. Um, what you find if you look at all the different particles uh, in the standard model, B is K is a whole lot. You find that this is uh, really quite a big number in comparison to the rest. And the reason that this is kind of nice is that whenever we build an experiment, usually what's going to be uh, the experiment, what the experiment's going to be sensitive to is some sort of branching ratio. You know, if you collect a certain number of muon decays, um, what uh, is the limit on the branching fraction. And the point is, is that if you have an equivalent limit on the branching fraction from different experiments uh, with different sorts of particles, the point with the muon is that you're going to get a much better reach in this new physics squared parameter, um, much better reach to higher scales or smaller couplings um, to, compared to other sort of uh, decays of other standard model particles. So that's uh, point one. Point two is uh, the more obvious one, is that, well, we actually get to this point where we have uh, an extremely large number of these guys. Uh, what's quite interesting to me, at least, is that these are uh, next generation of muon sources that are online or coming online in the not too distant future. Uh, these guys are gonna collect around about 10 to the eight or 10 to the nine muons per second. And just to emphasize how much of a jump this is, is that the last generation, uh, which is an experiment at the time, this collected this number of muons in a year. And now we're going to be doing the same in a second. And then the second part of my talk, which I should have just removed because I'm not going to get to, is what I spoke about earlier, where um, there's a muon on five here. So this uh, part of the talk is based on a couple of works that I put out at the end of last year with people in Berkeley, as well as uh, Diego Redigolo in Florence. Um, and really the main motivation beyond um, this extreme number of muons that we're going to collect is really to take this uh, ensemble of muon experiments that's being proposed uh, and do something a little bit different. So the idea is, is that there's a whole bunch of experiments, mu3, meg2, g minus two is a muon, um, as well as these three uh, mu to e conversion experiments. These are all rather single purpose experiments. They're not very expensive. Um, and they all have a sort of a flagship analysis that they would like. Uh, and this flagship analysis is usually the, uh, to search for heavy mu physics. So basically what we were doing is we're looking at, through the rare decays of the muons, what sort of access do we have rather to light new physics into weak new couples? Um, and in this set of experiments, can we make small changes to either data taking, analysis strategies, um, to search for this light new physics? And for me, why this is uh, quite an exciting endeavor to be in is that actually these collaborations are kind of small. Experiments are not too expensive. So much so that they're actually amendable to, you know, changing things or adding bits to their experiment if you can mount a good enough science case and show that um, they will actually have reached to some sort of uh, other physics beyond their flagship analysis. So it's really an opportunity uh, for a theorist to come in and be like, look, why don't you just stick a calorimeter over there and be like, it'll be great. <laughs> um, so that's why I'm personally quite interested in this whole sort of enterprise. And out of all of these experiments that I've listed 
at the bottom, uh, one of the ones that I personally like the most is uh, the move to 3E experiment. And one of the reasons is that this guy is actually a relatively simple experiment. It's just a kind of a, a lovely thematic detector. It's simply, uh, this is a slice through the experiment. It's just a big cylinder um, that's a lot longer than it is wide. Uh, the reasons will become obvious for that soon. Um, and the lovely thing is it's just super simple. Essentially, all of it is, is there is points of the target, there's these inner pixel layers, um, and then further out, there's these outer pixel layers. These are much longer than the inside ones. And then there's just a few scintillating fibers just to do timing to help reduce some of the background. And the reason that this uh, experiment is kind of fun is you really have to shelve any sort of LHC intuition you have. At the LHC, we're so used to having, you know, sure, we have a, a similar B field, but there we're colliding extremely high energy protons that end up producing stuff that has a lot of momentum. Here, what's actually happening is I have a, a beam of muons that are coming in. Uh, this beam of muons comes from pion decay, so they're still relatively low energy, and they're stopped on this target. And this target's kind of a ridiculous thing. It's this like micrometer thin film that's specifically designed to stop a muon and put it to rest um, while allowing the decay products of electrons and positrons to pass through the film. So the point is, if you have a muon decay, there's only so much energy. And the idea is, is that your electrons and positrons that come from this muon decay are going to be somewhere in the range of, you know, five, zero to 100 MeV. And so what this means is that in a one tesla uh, magnetic field, these guys are gonna be very, very heavily bent. So the whole principle of the detector is basically make it really long, and these electrons and positrons are gonna spiral around and deliver a large number of hits in these uh, pixel trackers. So it's really kind of compact, small, and cute. What's even, so the point here is that for this flagship analysis, the whole thing is optimized really to detect three electron positrons. Um, and the, everything about it is designed so that what you're looking for is for these three guys to perfectly reconstruct the neural mass. Um, however, the good part is, is that unlike the LHC, what they actually do is they save all of these uh, three E plus E minus uh, events to take. So now, if you're looking for any sort of signal that has those three electron positrons, even if it doesn't reconstruct the neural mass, you're in business and you can do it offline, which is very nice. So just to give you an idea of how this guy looks for uh, their flagship analysis, uh, this x-axis here is the reconstructed uh, invariant mass of the, the three electron positrons, number of events on the y-axis. These dotted guys are what some sort of uh, new physics signal would look like in mu3e. Uh, with various uh, sizes for the branching ratio. Um, and the red and the blue are their two main backgrounds. Uh, the red is simply radiative muon decay. So you just attach a photon to any of the charged particles and standard muon decay, um, which internally convert uh, to produce another electron positron pair on top of the standard electron. While this blue background is a coincidence background where you have one standard model decay, one Michel decay, and another sort of medium effect that can fake uh, the signal. So, so far I've told you, yep. What's that, sorry? Yes, yeah, these are all smearing effects because you are, um, because you don't, yeah, you don't have extremely good resolution on, on these guys. I mean, so there's two sort of configurations that can happen. You can pass through four layers of the pixel detector, you get four hits, or you can start spiral and end up with six or eight um, hits. And so the minimum requirement is you get four hits, um, and this dominates the uncertainty for the, the resolution. Okay, so but the, uh, the normal, you know, the three channel doesn't show the other, like, you know, the significant loop because, you know, uh, because of the existence of like, an invisible particle. Uh, on, yeah, on yeah. the black one? Or? No, 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 no. Yeah. Regular. Oh, the red one. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. 
um, what you're saying is you by insisting on a very large and variant mass, you're essentially insisting that the neutrino system has um, virtually no uh, invariant mass. Uh, which, of course, uh, if you ever try and do this with a with mad graphs, you're going to have a very miserable time. Discovered. <laughs> you can also see that there's just there's a lot more smearing that lowers the higher energy. Just looking at the signal, it's definitely bias towards the near left. I'm sorry. Uh, actually, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this tail um, on the radius of neon decay actually comes from uh, smearing a lower mass outwards. Right from the from the uh, the resolution on the uh, reconstructing the invariant mass. Um, okay, I've been usually thinking about pairs, but it's a similar similar sort of story. So. The next question is, well, where's the theory? I've just told you about an experiment that's pretty cool, but you know, what's it all about? And so for the first part, uh, these models I'm going to talk about are largely connected to Alps. Um, and here, really, the motivation is looking for things that arise from any sort of accidental uh, wave asymmetries in the standard model. And so usually what happens is these things uh, uh, have to be coupled in incredibly weakly. Um, but the, the general picture that emerges is that if you have some sort of flavor dependent Petri Klin charges, then usually what you're going to end up with is you're going to end up with two pieces. You're going to end up with a, a flavor conserving piece um, as well as a flavor violating piece. Now, in what follows, I'm going to, in the first part, largely talk about the flavor violating piece. Um, and I'm going to be neglecting most of these flavor conserving parts. And so you'll be very fair to ask, well, how does this compare if you build a UV model? Um, and the point is, is that what you generally find if you build a UV-complete sort of uh, flavored out sort of model is that in the best case scenario, these guys can be of similar size. However, what you generically expect is for this flavor violating piece to be an order of magnitude smaller than the flavor conserving piece. So what exactly does this uh, new physics look like? Well, there's, there's two categories. There's this lepton flavor violating piece that I've shown you before, which is going to be the first half of, of this part. And then there's also going to be lepton flavor conserving uh, pieces. Uh, and of course, uh, what's going to happen is there's obviously a, there's this flavored axion, which populates this sort of search channel. But this sort of search channel on the right hand side, there's a much larger space of models that can populate it. So when I get to that piece, I'll uh, come back and comment more carefully on what actually lives in this Lagrangian. So the first bit I'm going to talk about is this flavored out. This is a, a very, very, very simple search channel that U3E have already started to look into. Um, they have some conference proceedings publishing their sort of estimated sensitivity. And it's just how simple. You take a mu plus, and you have a two-body decay to your flavored out plus the positron. And so the search is super simple, and you look for a bump hunt in the positron momentum. However, you know, things are life's not too, too simple, unfortunately. Because of this guy being a two body decay, you run into a, a little bit of a wrinkle. And the problem really is, is that this edge of this uh, standard model neon decay, this kinematic edge, is the, the dominant way that they actually calibrate their entire detector. So if you inject new physics where you're calibrating your detector, um, you've got an issue or five. And so what this means is that they are only sensitive to a flavored axion um, that actually lives above around about 20, 25 MeV in mass. And the reason is, is that uh, to move this monochrome mass signal away from this edge requires a certain amount of mass. Um, and then you're in business because the signal will move to a region that you're not using to calibrate the detector. And the reason it's 25 and not actually 25 MeV and not just the, the resolution of the detector is simply a gain through the smearing. This lovely sharp edge I showed you at the Monte Carlo level actually looks like this when you consider their um, detector simulation. So this is from uh, a pair of old PhD thesis where she started to study what does this actually look like in their detector. Um, and so that's the reason for the 25 MeV. So the idea here is extremely simple, but very nice, I think. 
I'm also simply to trace the systematics of sticking my signal in my calibration region to paying a price statistic wise. And this price is uh, incredibly similar to the background where I take this diagram and all they do is I insist upon internal conversion on top of that panel. So I insist upon having E plus E minus pair uh, emitted off that signal. And you look at this and of course you're like, well, 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 Toby. There's a price to pay here, of course. And uh, I'm paying an extra factor of half a squared. Um, now instead of one to two, I'm now one to four. So I'm paying a pretty big phase space suppression. Um, and on top of this, now I'm also going to lose out a little bit on detector acceptance. So what I didn't explain very carefully is that for these electron positrons, there's a minimum amount of energy they need in order to make it through all the, the pixel layers. Otherwise, they're just going to get curled and basically spin, spin their wheels in one spot. So in order for that to happen, you need uh, a momentum of around about 10 MeV. And if you're making more and more positrons from a muon decay where you only have 100 MeV, you start to lose a significant fraction of your signal because some fraction of your electron positrons will be below that threshold. So that's a bit of a bummer. However, there's uh, two big wins. The first is, of course, what I iterated, that now we're away from the calibration edge. So we're not, um, we're not making our life difficult. However, the beauty is, is that uh, because we're using this now sample that has three electrons and not just one, is that this analysis can be taken from being an online analysis to an offline analysis because they record all of these three electron positrons um, to pay. Yeah. Do they look for and or say five electron events? <laughs> because what if your uh, axiom there is short lived and wants to be back to the electrons? I mean, my theory prior on that occurring is really quite low because you're already we're already like sensitive in terms of this wave of violating coupling. On the next slide, we're around about 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 uh, GEV for F. Okay, so it's going to be long. So it's going to be extremely long. Got it. Okay. Um, in the second part, that's exactly where we're going. We're like, okay, what if it's short lived? So that is there still uh, a weakness in the case where um, the X is coupled by the electron, uh, you know, the known labor violated thing that works, the labor violating. Yeah, the, the coupling here is explicitly flavor violating in the electron vector. Um, here I've also made no attempt to compare it to what would happen if you had flavor violation also in the quark sector. Um, that's something. Right. So then One, maybe five electrons are not possible. I mean, you could radiate it off another photon. But no, there was a paper by Maxim and company doing the five, uh, the five electron positron dance. Um, but they had a bit of an unfortunate error. They, they said this stopping target is not is completely hollow, and they assumed it was actually solid. And so they burnt a bunch of matches, working out what fraction of the electron positrons actually make it through the stopping target, which is a, a bit unfortunate. Which where it's exactly engineered so that these guys make it through through that energy. Um, so I think they're updating their paper now, and we'll, I think things should improve for their analysis. Um, but I guess the, the dash calibration scheme works out um, just for the flavor violating. Yes, this is just for flavor violating. We'll go full circle and do flavor conserving. Um, and then, of course, when you go back to flavor conserving, you start to have other models, dark photons, um, you might help you. I'm going to say it, shitty scalers <laughs> um, and other things. So, the search strategy, as I claimed, is really not rocket science. You now uh, you do a missing invariant mass search, uh, looking for this axion, um, and what you essentially have, depending on where your axion mass sits, is you're going to have a bump. Um, if the mass is less than 0.5 MeV, this bump is going to sit close to zero. Otherwise, it's going to sit somewhere where the background is larger. Um, and for this sort of search, the dominant background is again just the one you expected in the flight ship analysis, which is radiative muon decay. So with that all in hand, you can uh, do basically cut away your background and you have some chance of seeing the signal. You should note that 
These sort of searches I'm talking about now, these are all incredibly background dominated searches. Your signal is very, very small. Um, so you really have to understand the shape uh, at next to the order. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it might be just the same thing, but how do you have negative distance during that? Uh, it's simply just a factor from smearing. Um, so it's not physical, but when you do the smearing, it's convenient just to send that negative values. What, what's the definition of the missing from there? Uh, it's just the, uh, the mass minus the, the entity squared. Because you, you basically just have the system, you have the in the initial state, you have a stopped muon, so you know exactly what your initial state is. And then you're just subtracting off the momenta of the electrons, or squaring appropriately. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, sort of, but this is yeah, missing invariant mass is ever so slightly different. Um, so turning this into a limit, you get the following. Uh, there's uh, quite a lot happening on this uh, plot. First of all, on the x-axis is none other than a flavored axion mass. Y-axis is a decay constant for this guy. Um, and the result for this analysis of mu to 3e plus, plus alp uh, is shown in these orange curves. Phase one uh, is within the next uh, five years. Phase two is a follow-up where you go from having 2.5 times 10 to the 15 muons some tape to 5.5 times 10 to the 16. You have about an order of magnitude increase in the number of muons you collect. Now, in black, what you might see up here is first of all that this is this two body decay and the projections from U3E. And you look at it and you go, well, Toby, your analysis is a bit rubbish, isn't it? Both phase one and phase two are below these, uh, these black curves. However, what I want to emphasize is that here, this transition from a solid curve to a dash curve, this is exactly where we start to run into these systematic issues. Um, and so what your choice is and below these masses, and this is from my perspective, from a, a theory point of view, this is where these are the masses that are much more motivated compared to like sitting here at 50 MeV for your flavored axion. Um, here down in these lower masses, these two dash curves, um, the first and the very aggressive one is assuming that the collaboration come up with a completely independent way of calibrating the detector. At this point, I have no idea what they're thinking about. I don't think they have a, an idea of how to do this yet, but that's if they somehow come up with something. This lower dash line is if what they do is they mask out the region where they expect the signal to be, and then try and perform some sort of calibration on the remaining uh, spectrum from Michel decay. The problem with this though, is that this dash line only includes um, uh, statistic uncertainty and has no systematics from the, the shape of the, the rest of the Michel spectrum. So once you include systematics, I would also expect this to go down as well. The other nice thing about the search that we're proposing here is it scales very, very well with increased data. Um, there's no intrinsic limitations uh, systematic wise. And as you collect more and more muons, you expect this basically to march on. Now, on this plot, aside from these older experiments um, and astrophysical probes, there's also a bunch of other dashed lines. Um, we're not, of course, the first person, first people to plow into this business. Um, URA has his own proposal uh, for using U to E conversion. Um, there's another proposal from some of my collaborators to do like some sort of like forward search or a specific out dedicated run at May. But the point is with these different, uh, these two different uh, methods of probing this model, they all need to run dedicated runs. They can't just do it with their flagship analysis um, and do it at the same time. So for this guy, um, they would need to run a couple of months in a different configuration. Um, and for Yuri's proposal with mu to e, uh, it's not exactly clear to me exactly what they need to do, but uh, uh, there is some significant alterations of the experiment that need to happen for that to be possible. So those are the, the pluses and the downsides of this space. So moving right along, going from flavor violating back to uh, flavor conserving, uh, we now are looking at a very sort of similar channel to our background. It looks almost exactly the same. However, what we're doing is we're trading the standard model photon with some sort of new physics we're doing here be this a scalar or a vector. 
Now the search, search strategy is a little bit different. We're looking for a bump hunt in the different pairs of E plus E minuses. Um, however, before you get to that, you have to first think about, well, what sort of new physics lives here and is it prompt enough? Um, and so for instance, if you just added a, uh, this looks like this actually doesn't really matter. If you added something like a scalar, it's gonna have some sort of uh, half a width like that. If you plug in how it works, you end up with a C tau of around about five millimeters, so a tens of a minus five and the, the relevant energies uh, that these decay products have. I'd uh, the boost of the scalar has. However, what happens is that in this analysis and in the, in the normal standard data, hard to learn, data taking, you require an, an a three millimeters or less of displacement in your primary vertex, between the primary and the secondary vertex. So this is, if we do pump decay, this is a, a stringent requirement on, or a cutoff on uh, how low you can go in coupling. Um, however, of course, there's a lot of opportunities then to do something displaced because quite frankly, like the, the region the parameter space we're interested in is this sort of region where displaced vertex vertices will occur. And I'll uh, mention briefly what that looks like uh, towards the end. So back to the, the sort of search strategy plot again, signal and background, very similar, trading like a dark photon for a photon, the only difference. Now on the x-axis, I have the invariant mass of my E plus E minus pairs, number of events on the y-axis. Uh, and here the story is a, a little bit more complicated. You can see that there's solid and dashed lines. And the solid and dashed lines is just a difference in how I treat these two combinations of E plus E minuses. So for the dashed lines, I'm essentially treating the two different combinations as if they were independent events and just adding them as a sample. While the second one that's in solid, I'm saying I have a particular BSM model I'm looking for, and I have a hypothesis mass, and I'm picking the E plus and minus pair that's closest to that hypothesis mass. Um, and this is what leads to it's going to be incredibly similar in the region of interest so around the bump, but away, of course, uh, the background looks different, but it's not relevant. And these two uh, strategies end up being basically the same. However, conceptually, for what I'm going to show you and how we use the angular and kinematic um, information, it's a bit simpler to go with this, uh, this solid line where we're actually having our hypothesis mass and picking the pair that's closest. So this is a search that uh, has been proposed quite a while ago, and these user 3 e are already doing it. However, what we've noticed is that there's actually a lot more juice to be squeezed uh, from this particular lens in the sense that they've only done a bump hunt. But depending on the new physics that you're actually looking for, there's a huge amount of like extra kinematical angular information that can help um, discriminate the signal from background. And you really have to remember, let me go back and get rid of this stupid overlay. So you have to remember that this is a hugely magnified signal. Um, all the time here, you're in a regime where your background is huge compared to the signal. Um, having sufficient Monte Carlo statistics to do these things is, is quite tough. Um, so much so that the Music 3 e collaboration has actually just gone and stuff it. Um, they have a sample of 10 to the 15 uh, background Monte Carlo events that they have on tape. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I have a question. Would the uh, positron uh, in the part of the other uh, process contribute to the background as well? Um, as a third uh, actor? Yeah, I'm going to get to that. I think it will be a little bit clearer in, in a moment. Um, I think my next slide uh -huh, is exactly that. So I can't claim innocence here because I was the one who devised this uh, naming scheme for the different electrons and positrons. Um, there's lots of subscripts. The thing to remember is when you see the S on the positron, what it stands for is single, solo, solitary, any sort of F word you can come up with that's roughly the same. It's the positron that isn't considered to be in the E plus E minus pair that reconstructs the new resonance. Whereas the one with the X is the one that is taken to be in that pair. The reason this is important is so say I had like a dark photon model with my dark photon living at 70 MeV. Um, okay, the signal is gonna be this peak at 70 MeV. 
But now the background contributions are going to be interesting because for the backgrounds, you have all of these four possibilities um, where you attach the photon either to the muon or to the outgoing positron. Uh, and then the different pairs, so one possible pair here on this row and another possible pair on the bottom row. And the point is, is that in the background, there's going to be some intrinsic combination of the whole lot. However, if you're in a region where you're insisting upon a larger variant of that, then these two diagrams are going to be very heavily suppressed because here you're taking the photon to be very, very, very off shell. Um, and so what you're actually going to prefer is you're going to actually take the pair that is actually not the pair from the, the off shell photon, um, it's quote unquote the incorrect pair, which are incidentally has like a collinear singularity. And so this is something that allows us to straight away get at some sort of difference uh, between signal and background. Um, I think every time I get to this slide, I explain it in a different way, in some new and terrible way. So if it's a bit confusing, uh, I can probably confuse you further, with all I promise. So what's better is maybe to look at an example. Um, and here is exactly this cosine angle um, for the background for different choices of this hypothesis mass. So this combination I'm insisting upon. Um, and what you see is that no matter what you do, uh, unless you get to very small masses, you always have this uh, sort of collinear singularity in your backgrounds. And now it really depends on what is your signal model. And so here I've shown you maybe the best case scenario, which is having some sort of new scalar that couples predominantly with muons. Now to produce the signal, it needs to couple to both muons and electrons, of course. Otherwise, you're just going to have a missing energy signature, the completely different to this. But here there's some sort of hierarchy in my muon and electron coupling to the scalar, and you get some sort of distribution that is really anti-correlated uh, with this collinear singularity in the background. Um, so this is just one of the maybe easier examples to explain uh, where there's a bunch of different uh, angular correlations and kinematic variables can actually help you quite a lot. Sorry, pardon me, the reason that the background takes different shapes is that part of your background reconstruction assumes a hypothesis mass. Yeah, okay. Um, but but sorry, even if you didn't do this, even if you just added the samples together, right, in the other method, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be doing a bump hunt. You're going to be doing a cut and count around the bar um, where your resonance mass is. So this affects you more and more strongly as you go to uh, higher invariant masses for the E plus and minus pair, okay. because you're insisting on the photon being more and more off shell if you did this. Yeah. Um, but this, this guy just drops like a like a rock rock, like an exponential and an exponential, whereas the other guy just drops like an exponential. So what other sort of variables are there? Um, there's things like, for instance, just the energy of this uh, solitary orbitron. Um, depending on the signal model, you see that there is some discriminating power, for instance, in the muon coupling, less so in the electron. <laughs> Excuse me. And then there's also some other weird angles between some of the positrons that actually help you in a sort of intermediate mass regime. Here, like the 30 MeV uh, signal mass, you see that there's uh, some quite significant difference compared to um, between the background and the signal. So actually, no, I said this the wrong way around. At higher masses, this is great. And also has some power at, at lower masses. No, no, at higher masses, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, putting this all together, unfortunately, is a, a rather complicated beast. The point is, is that it's very, very difficult to have a large enough background Monte Carlo to then be going and considering a whole handful of different angles. So given uh, our abusive computing infrastructure, the best we're able to do and still preserve sufficient Monte Carlo statistics was to consider on top of the bump hump, by the bump hump, only two kinematical or angular variables at a time. Uh, and so, depending on what you choose, uh, you do better or worse at lower or higher masses. For instance, here was um, 
the observable decoding here, similarity, and then the energy fraction, as well as two other fractions. What you see, first of all, is that um, at low mass, the ability to distinguish these neural models is quite good. Um, while at higher masses, it becomes less dependent on what the model is. The sanity check in this sort of whole endeavor is the dark photon. Now, the dark photon, um, if you start to take the dark photon mass smaller and smaller, then this is going to start to look more and more like the photon. Um, and then you're going to lose any sort of ability to distinguish. And so, as you would expect, you see that as you go to lower and lower masses, you ask them to straight back to one. The beautiful thing about this uh, sort of guy, though, is that this, what we've done here using just two variables, is, you know, it's a really a simplistic uh, theorist thing. Uh, when they actually have data, what they'll be able to do is they'll be able um, to use a data-driven background estimate and throw the whole ensemble of angles and kinematical variables at it and do much, much better than what we do here. So this is just for a couple of toy models. How does this look, for instance, if you plug it in a well-known, beloved, like, dark photon frame? Now, what you see here is um, the thick lines of phase one, the thin lines of phase two. Um, solid is using our uh, angles, dashed is without just the vanilla bump. Um, and you see that, you know, there's a modest improvement here for doing very little more, little extra work. So yeah, this is just a reminder to them to really be like, look, you can, especially in this region of interest at around about 2030 MEV, there's definitely uh, more to be squeezed in order to you know, make it down uh, further into these sort of regimes. And here, uh, meter 3 is actually pretty nicely poised, um, simply because it's going to be one of the earlier things to explore. You might notice that I have a bell 2 curve here, but uh, this is a lot, a lot of data. <laughs> um, and this guy is really back up here for the more. Um, the runs that are happening to this is like a end of the end of the line bell two projection. I totally forgot to uh, add an earlier bell two curve, but that's it. Dark quest is uh, one of the many million beam dump things, and Magic X is some sort of uh, actually mines uh, experiment that they're planning. Uh, I have no idea what the timeline that is. So that's uh, one sort of possible model that can populate this scalar vector sort of story. Another is, of course, the scalar or pseudo scalar. Um, and so what I've done here is I've done the very uh, sort of mean, not very nice thing, where what I've done is I've picked the value of the electron coupling so that it's false. Um, and I've then I've varied the neuron coupling. So this is like maybe the most maximally dishonest way of ever showing these sort of three-dimensional plots, uh, cherry picking my way away. And you notice that even when I cherry pick, it really doesn't look very good, does it? You know, G minus two is a uh, kicking your ass both on the scalar and the pseudo scalar case, um, depending you know what ends up happening with the lattice computations versus the um, the extractions of the um, hadron hadron vacuum polarization piece. Um, this will either be a limit or this limit will probably come further down if I was to take the money. Um, we're basically only really able to cut into new parameter space with phase two of this guy. Now, we did also look at a bunch of other models, um, scalars coupled to only to electrons, other sorts of vectors like LV minus LE, and also anomalous versions. Um, but what you what we found basically, uh, including the motivated case where this ratio is the mass hierarchy uh, set by new colors. Uh, what we found basically is that in these other cases, V to 3 is not really competitive. Fortunately, though, um, this was just for the prompt case. Now, for the displaced case, which I'm starting to look into and you know, do some rough estimates and see how it actually works out, the displaced looks a, a little bit more promising in terms of the space of options that will actually work. And the whole reason why this has any chance of working it's simply because this stopping target is really quite big. You can look for displaced decay if decay is actually happening inside it, and the vertexing of the meter 3 is good enough to do this. And something I didn't really mention, but the whole reason for this stopping target um, is very different than LHC, where you really want the interaction point to be really focused and know where it is. Here, they actually deliberately spread the beam. And so if you spread the beam, and then 
the thing comes in this way and it hits the stock, this target, right? You're going to end up with a distribution across the whole cone, double sided cone. And the reason for this is that what you want to do is you want to spread out where the muon decays are happening so you can avoid any sort of coincidental uh, muon decays going off at the same time. And so this ends up being very useful for doing displaced decays. Um, the only real downside is that if you start having displaced vertices flying off, um, even out here or here, you're again, because of this shorter inner pixel layer, you do lose a bit of detector efficiency, but it's not a big disaster. Um, yeah. Are there many backgrounds with just two electrons back? Would you get worried, I guess, that you would interpret a displaced decay as one single in the shell decay and some other background that has? Yeah, so seven. one of these backgrounds that I showed you on the very introductory slide, there was a red one. There was also this like blue super jagged thing. What this is, is it's one Michelle decay going off. And then something that is creating a photon or some sort of material effect, creating an E plus and minus, and then being traced back to apparently being the same vertex. Mm -hmm. And so this is exactly the reason for this whole spreading the beam and everything. It's not necessarily two initial decays, but it's some sort of conversion of material plus initial. But now that would be making exactly, exactly, exactly. But the whole point is that this is uh, rather carefully set out. And if you look at the timing resolution, if you take the, the delta P, what you actually have is on average, you have 0 0.5 muon decays per timing slice. So, I mean, you still have to simulate this background. It's not going to be completely zero, but it's going to be six, seven, eight orders of magnitude compared to these other backgrounds I've been showing you where they're just like <laughs> yeah. right up here. So, then uh, this is a crude estimate I did the other day. Um, I don't place a bunch of stock on this, it was quite conservative as well. I can probably push the numbers quite a bit. But I think it's just useful to place here just to see really how different it looks. Um, of course, you have a very different shape now because you're insisting that you have displacement between about three millimeters and about 25 odd millimeters. Um, so this set this distinctive shape. Um, but yeah, uh, there's a bit of work to be done to, to actually check how this looks. And for the other sort of models that I didn't include, whether there's sufficient scope to actually simulate all of this properly. So I think I'm going to uh, leave it here. The first uh, important point was that we can bypass this horrible calibration issue with uh, insisting upon an extra E plus and minus pair um, if needed. Hopefully the experimentalists come up with something better, but no matter what, this, will, this should work. Um, it's music 3 in my opinion, is a better way of doing this um, compared to these other experiments I told you, told you about, MEG2 and new to e, new to e conversions. Um, but depending on what MEG2 does, they might decide, look, we're going to do this axion dedicated run, then they have the potential of beating the beta 3 But it's really going to depend on what the collaborations choose to do. Um, so that's a, a bit of the story there. And the second is, of course, a much simpler message, look at angular variables and kinematics. Um, and here there's going to be a bunch of extra things that can be squeezed out. So I think I'll end there. So thank you very much for coming and listening to me twice. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious with the second search. Um, I appreciate that you only have three tracks, but is it possible in some cases to reconstruct the secondary vertex and kind of do away with which is the correct thing and doing that that just say, well, these, this one electron is skewed to these two, so it can't be the correct one. I mean, that's just something I haven't thought of because we were so much in the mindset that these guys are swamps. But you're right from the point of view that there starts to be a little tiny bit of displacement, especially as you get towards the edge of what the phase two sensitivity is. So maybe in this region between phase one and phase two, you might have enough scope to have a little bit of displacement in some of the models. And then you'd be in business. Um, I should do that and check how that works. A good thought. So, okay, given your bottom rank plot there, mm -hmm. the improvement that you get from the angular variables depends significantly on the type of new physics that you have. Yeah. So, is there any hope that if you detect this new physics, yeah. you yeah. can tell what you have? Yeah. Okay. Is that something you guys want yeah. to Yeah, we looked a bit, but uh, okay. I mean, first, like, can't find it, but once you find it, it's like these people will do this straight away. Uh, cool. I think it's pretty obvious. 
Um, so maybe they didn't appreciate how much of a difference some of these angular variables, how how they mediate differently for the different models. So we hope that they get that as a take home message. I think it is. 10 to the 15 decron Monte Carlo. And it's really not enough that you can do. Stuff. Oh, no, 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 no. They have 10 to the 15. Oh, you don't. <laughs> we don't. Got it. I mean, I mean, uh, Ben's very protective of his computing time. And if I told him, Ben, you know, I'm just going to run Mad Graph for 10 to 15 events. <laughs> uh, not only will I have to come back in 50 years. <laughs> but uh, they have a in-house uh, sort of little Monte Carlo that they've set up in the user 3 collaboration. Um, really, if you ever do these sort of studies, please, uh, on this intensity frontier, please set up your own Monte Carlo. You literally cannot use Mad Graph and other things. You're really wasting your time. But you know, I just got deep enough into it. I'm like, I can make it work. <laughs> Hacked the hell out of it. It was like, ha ha ha. <laughs> so, do they have to have the level of precision you were talking about needing next week? Yeah, yeah, they have that. They have this all coded up. And yeah. these calculations have already been done next week more than yeah. actually. So, I think we're in good shape. Yeah, miserable when you go next. That would be extremely miserable. Also, um, uh, this radiative muon decay is a process that's actually measured as well. So you've got those two handles. I was wondering if you're getting yourself in trouble with data driven background analysis. Like, if, if, if your signal is mixed, then you're trying to do this angular stuff, but you're still, your signal still so small, you can't really do polygon. I don't think so, but I mean, I must admit, uh, it's something I only really thought about when I was actually. Writing these talks, I was like, wait, it's kind of tying you back to what you started with. Mm -hmm. point, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, you're doing data driven background, but then your signal's in your background. In yeah, your but, it, but in this case, it's not on the place where you're doing the calibration, but that's okay. There, it's a very particular case where you're, you're just your new physics, like really maxing your skills over. <laughs> like, I'm gonna live right there. <laughs> You mentioned that you have significant losses due to needing all three of the electrons to be hard. Mm -hmm. Could they, surely they have thought about doing spiraling multiple hits in the inner tractor and reconstructing something relatively accurately? Yeah, so yeah. there's a shameful bit of a story to be told there, is that um, I, for a long time I was incapable of calculating the gyro radius of an electron. <laughs> 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 and I had a factor there's a factor two wrong or something. So much so that I was like, can only be electron positrons. They're never making it to this outer pixel layer. So in my head, I was like, they're probably doing exactly what you're suggesting, just doing four hits in the inner layers, but they're not. I just screwed up the gyro radius calculation. Um, so do they have some triggering problem or background problem? I'm not actually sure or what the problem is there. It's something I actually need to ask them. Because they're in the PDR, which I bring carefully, they don't really perform it for this. Because if you could take two hard and one spiral and one inner spiraling, you would increase mm -hmm. your acceptance significantly. Yeah, quite, quite a big amount. Yeah. Because, like, for instance, if you take a dark photon uh, model at like 20 MeV, your acceptance, uh, your signal efficiency is like 1, 2%. Or so. Mm -hmm. so it's a pretty big deal. When you go higher, it gets better. But then you're also, yeah. Um, and maybe, uh, that'd be nice just to put some numbers on what I mentioned earlier. Um, here's the, the neutrino energy that these neurons that I was talking about. And here is okay, anti -elect neutrino electron flux. Um, there's a bunch of background atmospheric neutrinos, reacting neutrinos. There's some data from super coming and super coming and uh, Kaplan. As well as some of our projections for how big this flux would be, assuming a certain fraction of neurons can escape and so on. This is absurdly large. <laughs> um, and you see that going back to something more realistic, general minus three, general minus four, you know, you're really below the atmospheric neutrino background, you know, with some sort of like wishful thinking contraction, you're still not in great shape. And you're even like much more subdominant compared to. The diffuse supernova neutrino background. So, really, this idea is a bit of a pipe dream, but uh, I'm not convinced that we've gotten to the, the bottom of it yet. So, stay tuned for that. 
Are there questions? So I actually have some questions. Like, um, what's the uh, the material of um, you know, puzzle part? Um, it is. Oh no, my chemistry is bad. So I mess up with M Y something, my my on my something. Okay. Oh, I want to look it up. <laughs> with the this you know the structure of the system, finite. Ah uh, yes, it's uh about a, a micron thick. Oh, so the, 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 exactly, exactly. Okay, so it's a very thin yeah. film, and you're basically like you're you're staring at the beta block equation, being like, my muon lives here, and my electrons live here. How am I gonna stop one but not the other? But mm -hmm. the, somehow the muons can't stop. The muons are stopped and the electron positrons are not. Mm -hmm. Okay. We can we can pull out the beta block equation later if you'd like. <laughs> so even inside the, the hollow target. Um, the, so um, actually what's seen. Let me, this is not a good idea. I'll show you later. But uh, basically they have this very lovely plot of where they've simulated with Giant and they're and their stopping target, but what you see is that all of the muon decays happen on the on the film uh, of this this cone, you, and a bunch of course pass straight through. But that's it. There's a um, contribution. Say that multi multi layer inside. No, 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 just one layer. One layer. And some muons pass it all the way through and just keep going down the beam line, and others are stopped. This is why it's double sided, right? But they don't fill the volume. There, right? No, they don't fill the volume. They're stopped perfect only on the surface. Some of them, only some of them. Yeah, yeah, only some of them. Okay. And then how do you, um, you know, estimate the uh, uh, the number of the muons actually stuck inside the, the particle? Uh, you record them all. Yeah. You're like, haha, muon decay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't take any of these things for granted. I'm so glad I don't have to build such a thing. <laughs> Okay, so any further questions? Okay, so if not, let's take it. So here's.